All right, we will go ahead and get started. We want to uh, certainly welcome everybody and, and uh, run through a couple of announcements uh, before we get to the, the main event uh, today. And, and you know, we, we do want to welcome everybody. We've got season ticket holders. We've got our, our local partners on board. We've got members from the community uh, joining us today and, and also folks that, that are brand new to the Windy City Bulls family. So we want to welcome everybody to this special event. Um, this is a, the first of a series of, of webinars, and once we get back to normal life, um, in-person uh, networking events that we are going to be pleased to be rolling out uh, in the coming months. And so we want to welcome everybody for joining today. Um, give you a little bit of update about what we've been up to over the last seven weeks since the hiatus started. Um, certainly from our, our business side, we've been very busy both wrapping up. Uh, the suspended season, which is still, still technically suspended, um, but we've also been doing a lot of planning for next year and, and just preparing ourselves for whenever that schedule may roll out and, and um, getting ready to put together the themes, the, the special events that everybody who is part of the Windy City Bulls family has uh, come to know and love. And so we're excited about doing all that. In addition to those things, um, we've also been involved in some community initiatives. So over the last month, We've hosted uh, some auctions to raise money for some local partners and, and supporting their efforts in, in uh, uh, com combating the, the pandemic. And so we've been pleased to raise some money for some local organizations. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing, and we actually just announced it, but for the last month um, and for the next month in May, we've been selling uh, through a partnership with Blink Tees, a local uh, Hoffman Estate screen printer, this player design t-shirt. Um, with all the proceeds going to the Schaumburg Food Pantry. So we encourage uh, you, if you have not, uh, to log into shoplocaltees.com. Uh, take a look at not only this shirt, but all the other shirts that they're selling to support local businesses. And uh, again, just a small thing that, that we're trying to do to, to support those who are at the, the forefront of, of this fight that we're all in. Um, in addition to those events, we, we've started accepting nominations for individuals who are making an impact in your community, in our community, um, and, and so we're accepting community um, hero nominations. If you go to our website, windycitybulls.com, um, you'll see all the information on how to submit information about those individuals making a difference. We look forward to recognizing them during our big annual event, Community Heroes Night, next season. Um, and so we encourage you to share those stories with us, and we'll also be sharing them out on uh, social media as well. Um, on the business side, again, as I mentioned, we've been uh, doing a lot of planning, a um, lot of meeting. And then on the G League side, um, as you may have read, there's been a lot of news uh, of late. Uh, the new development program for players um, is certainly an exciting uh, development for the league. It's brought a lot of recognition. Um, three of the top high school prospects have committed to play in that. We don't yet quite know what their schedule is going to look like, and, and there's some other questions that have to be answered. But, you know, the recognition and, and awareness to the G League um, has been positive over the last couple of weeks since that came out. Um, and then in addition to that, we continue to do a lot of planning and discussion uh, with the league itself as, as we look and, and figure out, um, as many businesses are doing, how we're going to restart and, and what our games and, and events may look like next season. Um, on our team side, uh, you know, our players are sheltering in place just like the rest of us. They're back in their hometowns uh, with their families. Um, but the other exciting development, if you will, is um, head coach Damian Cotter, GM Josh Prybeck. They've been taking this time to meet on a regular basis with the new leadership in Chicago. And, you know, we welcome our tourist Connor Silvas. We welcome Pat Connolly, uh, both formerly of the Nuggets. And, and, you know, the cool thing about it for us is they both bring a familiarity with the Windy City franchise, given the relationship that we had last season with the Nuggets and them assigning players to our franchise. So Josh and Damian have been taking a lot of time in the, in the last few weeks to get to know them as they build out their overall uh, development plans. Um, beyond that, uh, on the league level, um, you know, as a reminder, we're welcoming a new franchise, the Mexico City franchise. We've had the opportunity to meet with them and their leadership. Um, so, you know, the, the league is expanding and continues to, to expand. And so we, we're, we're excited to welcome the, the new Mexico City franchise. So those are a couple of announcements and things that we've been doing. We've appreciated hearing from our, our, our Windy City family over the last 
um, several weeks since this hiatus began. And we encourage you to continue to do that as well. We enjoy hearing from you. And then likewise, you know, we wanna be here to, to serve you and help out wherever we can. Um, so beyond that, uh, we are, we're again, pleased to, to welcome, um, you know, special guests today. Uh, and then, and then this, this unique uh, program that we, we are, are presenting and, and again, look forward to presenting as, as we move forward. So um, I wanna welcome our host today, uh, uh, someone that, that we got to know very well this past year, Mark Shinowski, as a member of our broadcast team. Mark is a longtime member of Chicago uh, sports media, has been involved in, in the local sports scene for decades. Um, and as a little uh, cool side note, um, I've learned that you will hear his name uh, in the upcoming Last Dance documentary. They're, they're pulling a couple of his reports that he did back in the 90s. So, um, you know, Mark's become a great friend of the organization and he'll be hosting today. And then, um, you know, we're, we're also pleased to welcome uh, our special guest, Matt Doherty, who is, uh, you know, has a legendary basketball career, was on a, a great team back in 1982 uh, that won the NCAA championship. Um, and, and has uh, set, spent his post-playing career, you know, in, in head coaching capacities with both his alma, alma mater at North Carolina, Notre Dame, uh, amongst others. So we are pleased to turn the program over to them as they talk through their conversation and, and, uh, and questions, many of which that have been submitted by our, our fans. We do want to encourage you to pay attention to the chat room on the, on the right-hand side of your screens. Um, feel free to ask any questions that may come to your mind. We'll try to work those into the program. And then we're also gonna be dropping some trivia uh, over the next hour. And we're gonna be giving away some, some eyeglasses, some sunglasses from our friends at Zenny. Uh, we have $200 gift cards that we'll be uh, awarding to people. So keep an eye on the chat room. We'll be dropping some trivia about Matt, uh, Windy City and the Chicago Bulls. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark Shinowski and let him take it away with Matt. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank Brad for inviting me to be a part of the program. and want to say hello to Matt Doherty. We really are glad to have you with us this afternoon. We want to thank all the season ticket holders and everybody else who's joining us for today's webinar. And Matt, you won't remember this because you've done so many media interviews, but I, I actually interviewed you when you were the head coach at Notre Dame. Uh, you were having a really good season there, and I know fans in the Chicago area were really so sad to see you go back to your alma mater. I imagine the allure of being a chance to coach at North Carolina was something that you probably had to grapple with a little bit because you did so well at Notre Dame. Take us through that period of time in your life. Well, first of all, thank you, Mark, and I appreciate Brad's comments. Uh, it, it's neat to be a part of this, and I, I love the turnout as I've seen the participants, 172. Uh, that's, that's a great turnout, so I appreciate everyone that's listening. Um, as an Irish Catholic kid growing up in New York to be the head coach at Notre Dame, Literally the day of my press conference, my parents flew in from New York. My mother is Mary Cleary Darty. Um, I'm one of five kids. Uh, I was an altar boy. Um, we're walking on campus, and my mother sees um, touchdown Jesus, and I call I call it three point Jesus. I was trying to change the <laughs> I was trying to change the culture in South Bend a little bit, and she grabs my arm and she says, "You know, Matthew." She kind of whispers. You know, Matthew, if you couldn't be a Catholic priest, being the head basketball coach at Notre Dame is a close second. <laughs> That's a true story. And so when when North Carolina when when Bill Guthridge resigned at North Carolina, I called Coach Smith. I said, Hey coach, if no Kansas calls, what should I do? Because I'm thinking Roy's going to North Carolina, Kansas may call because I was there for seven years as an assistant coach. And he said, well, you're on a short list and uh, it's not a done deal here with Roy yet. And I laughed and I said, I, I, we were on Lake Michigan. We were, we were vacationing up in the St. Joe's somewhere up in, the, in Lake Michigan. And I said, uh, well, that's a no brainer. You know, just like that's never gonna happen. Roy's gonna take it. I couldn't see myself or fathom ever being, you know, you dream about being the head coach in North Carolina, but." You don't think that's ever going to happen. And then literally like a week later, he said, uh, he offered me, basically offered me a job. He said, could you take it? I said, well, coach, I don't know. You know, I've got to talk to my wife. And he said, well, a week ago, you said it was a no-brainer. And, and so that's typical Coach Smith of spinning it. The guy who probably put the nail in the coffin was Michael Jordan. 
because Coach Smith had Michael call me, and Michael said, if you don't take the job, we're probably going to go outside the family and hire Rick Majerus. And when I heard that, I didn't want anybody outside of the Carolina family leading our program. So I decided to leave. But it was very difficult because I still love Notre Dame. Um, uh, Mike Bray's done an amazing job. I'm a Notre Dame fan. I've got friends in, uh, in that air, in, in, at that university. Um, I, I would have loved for my kids to attend there. Uh, it's a special place. And I was only there nine, I was only there a year, um, but I feel a part of it. And uh, um, hindsight's twenty twenty. but yeah, there's part of me that says I wish I'd never left. What's it been like for you, Matt, watching the Last Dance documentary? I know the first couple of episodes, they really featured Michael's time in North Carolina. And we see number 44 with those white legs attacking the basket. What was that like for you? Well, you're being gracious, Mark. I don't know if I ever attacked the basket. Um, <laughs> I was pretty good at attacking the buffet line, but the basket, not so much. Um, it's pretty cool. You know, uh, as you can see in my background, I still have the jersey there. I jokingly say the university wasn't going to retire my jersey, so I decided to retire. <laughs> um, and then there's a picture there of Michael Jordan and I. Um, and there's another picture over there of Michael hitting the game-winning shot in that 82 championship game with me in the background. <clears throat> you know, sometimes you're just lucky. You're, you're lucky to make a decision at 17 to attend the University of North Carolina and play college basketball and lucky that a guy like Michael Jordan decides to show up to be with guys like James Worthy, Sam Perkins, Kenny Smith, Dean Smith, um, Al Wood, I, I'm going to miss some names, Brad Darty. I was just lucky and, and, and lucky to make that decision at 17 and, and, and then to play, uh, play significant minutes uh, on a special team with special guys. Uh, I'm just truly blessed and to see it come back full circle after all these years. You know, we're, we're all fortunate that we were Michael's teammates because we all get some uh, extra exposure as a result. Now, Matt is a great motivational speaker. He's touring the country, giving different speeches to organizations, and we're so lucky to have him here with the webinar. And one of the features that we're going to have over the next hour or so is we're going to give people a chance to ask their questions for Matt as well. We're going to talk about leadership, both on and off the basketball court. And Matt, I want to start with a question from Greg Essenberg. He's the director of food experience with Sporting Kansas City and Major League Soccer. And he references the fact that you played against and coached against some of the biggest names in the history of college basketball. How did that help your career in terms of leadership, going against those guys? Well, you, 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 you try to learn. Like, you, you want to learn from everybody you meet. Uh, I, I, someone once told me 15 years ago, you're a lifelong learner. And I never heard that term. And, and, but, you know, like, I take that as a compliment. I try to learn. If I'm sitting with you at dinner, I want to know what you do and how you do it and why you're good at it. Because maybe I can steal something and apply it to what I'm doing so I can get better. I think, you know, that's the thing that made Michael so great. He, you know, yeah, he's talented, he's smart, but he wanted to get better. He wanted people to, to tell him the truth and challenge him to see where he stood and what he needed to work on. So I think when you're around greatness, from Dean Smith to Michael Jordan, and everybody in between, you know, if you don't learn something, shame on you. So I think the things that I, I learned um, was really, at the end of the day, there's nothing like experience. And that could be good experience, but bad experience. And when I, when I became a head coach, you know, you think you know it all. You think you're prepared, and then you realize, oh, my gosh, you know, I, I, I don't. I don't know. It's lonely at the top. It is lonely as the head coach. And you need to surround yourself with a good team. I'm not talking about players. I'm talking about assistant coaches or in the world of business, you know, VPs, you know, uh, your, your senior staff. You better have some good people around you and then listen. I think mining for the truth um, is one of the most, thing, most important things you do as a leader. I talk about six steps. I jokingly call it Stebbit, uh, some guy I met on my leadership journey, S-T-E-V-I-T. 
I have to use acronyms. I wasn't smart enough to get through school without them. And the S stands for self. You got to know yourself. Then you got to know your team. Then you got to know your environment. Then you got to have a vision. Then you've got to know the industry. And then you got to know the truth. And I think a lot of people may get the first five right, but they really don't mind for the truth. And if you don't mind for the truth, if you don't manage the truth, the truth will manage you. And you'll be ended up with a pink slip looking for another job. Leadership can come in a lot of different forms. Sometimes it's very vocal. Sometimes it's behind the scenes, pat on the back. You reference Michael Jordan. And people who are watching the documentary now are seeing his fiery style, trying to motivate his teammates by being at times brutally harsh. Now, when you know him, he jokes about the fact when he came to Carolina, he was Mike Jordan. Then he hits the game-winning shot in the 82 National Championship game. He became this national phenomenon, Michael Jordan. Develops with the Bulls into a multiple-time scoring champion, six-time NBA champion, considered by many to be the greatest player in the game. And now he's with Charlotte as a team owner and not having a lot of success. What have you seen in terms of what made him special, not only as a basketball player, but as a leader of a group? Well, I think he has uh, – one. I think he's smart. I, 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 don't, I think sometimes that's often overlooked. Um, he is smart. He's a smart guy. And I think he understands the root motivation of people. He can, he can get to that root motivation quickly, the core motivation of an individual, whether it's money or fame or whatever motivates them. And then he's not – he's confident enough – to tell you what he thinks. He's a truth teller and the world needs more truth tellers. So he's not afraid to tell Dennis Rodman what he thinks or Scottie Pippen what he thinks or Phil Jackson what he thinks. And I think that, uh, you know, that's something that young people are afraid of doing these days because they're afraid to hurt someone's feelings. Michael wasn't afraid to hurt someone's feelings. Yeah, we've seen that, no question about it in the documentary. How does your leadership style differ from a guy like Jordan who was fiery and not afraid to call people out on the court? Obviously, you spent a lot of time as a head coach on the college level. Do you find that you sometimes have to tailor that leadership approach to different individuals to make sure that they can perform at their peak efficiency? Well, quite frankly, I think my leadership style is very similar to Michael's. Okay. Uh, I, I demand accountability. I was not afraid to call people out. Um, but your biggest strength's your biggest weakness. And I think that sometimes, you know, I was intense. And sometimes if you're tense and you cross a line, you're too intense and that's a bad thing. You can be nice and then you can be too nice and that's a bad thing. And I think I had to learn to control that a little bit better. And it's always a work in progress. As a player, you know, like Michael, I think that, you know, I've heard that when he was with Washington, when he came back as a player, a lot of people, players didn't like that. He was a little bit of a younger generation. They didn't like to be talked to, to like that. And it, doesn't, it, it, it wasn't received as well, maybe, as when he was with Tony Kukoc and Scottie Pippen. And, you know, for whatever reason, generations, or maybe he was closer to them. Um, so you have to know the team. You know, again, I go back to Stevitt. You know yourself and you got to know your team. And I think the beauty, uh, the thing I, I love about the last dance is now, as much as I respected Phil Jackson, I respect him even more. Because people say, oh, it's easy to coach. He had, he had Michael and Scotty or he had Kobe and Shaq. No, 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 no. It's easy to coach average talent it's hard to coach real talent because you have all the personalities you need to deal with and you know when phil would say call michael in and say hey dennis has something to say to you you know dennis doesn't have anything to say to michael the last person he wanted to talk to was michael <laughs> because he didn't want michael coming down on him he didn't want to disappoint michael but phil knew how to manage those personalities and and his Native American connection with Rodman was really cool and again Phil very smart guy and 
you know, he understood how to, you want to treat everyone fairly as a group, but you need to treat everyone differently. And I think that's something that if I were to coach again, I would be better at. Well, Matt, as you know, there's a lot of Notre Dame fans here in the Chicago area and a lot of interest in the time that you spent in South Bend. When you took over the program there, just getting started as, as a Division I head coach, what was your mindset like and how did you prepare yourself for what looked like it was going to be a big challenge? Because really, you really built the culture and set the stage for Mike Bray to come in and have the success that he did. Well, I think the biggest thing for me was that Notre Dame – and I talked to Bob Davey about this when he was coaching football there. Um, they were soft. It was a soft program. And I was going to make it a tough-minded program. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge. But I had a good assistant in Doug Wojcik. Uh, he and I with the same mindset. Uh, and then I added to my staff with Fred Cordobon, Bob McKinnon, and David Kaysan. And we challenged these guys from day one, man. You know, like, you know, it's not okay. It's not okay to be soft. It's not okay to accept defeat. And really, you know, when you, if you talk to some former players, they'll mention 304. And if you saw a miracle on ice, when the head coach, after one of their exhibition games, the team lost, and he made them skate till they threw up. Well, we lost to an, an exhibition game by 24 points, and we were to play Ohio State a week later. Ohio State had beaten that team by about 25. And the next day, we were supposed to have off from practice, but the headline in the paper said, lack of days of effort dooms the Irish. And I called my assistants, and I said, you know, I've been called a lot of things in my life, but not lack of days ago. And we had practice, but there were no basketballs. And we made them run and run and run and run <laughs> and run some more. And they didn't like it. Some guys threw up. Some guys left practice. I didn't care. I was tough on them. A week later, we beat Ohio State at Ohio State, and Ohio State was ranked fifth in the country. I'm getting goosebumps as I tell the story. Because you can make people tougher. You can change the culture of a program. And the biggest thing is you have to know your environment before you step into it. I tried to do the same thing at North Carolina. They were talented. They'd been to the Final Four the year before. But they had 30 years of success. They didn't think they needed the change. And I think one of the biggest challenges of a leader is managing change. At Notre Dame, they embraced it. The administration embraced it. They knew they needed it. At North Carolina, they didn't embrace that intensity because they didn't think they needed it. After you left North Carolina, you went on to coach at a smaller university at, at Florida Atlantic. What was that transition like for you, and how did that challenge your motivational and leadership skills? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I went on a leadership journey after I was forced to resign at North Carolina. I took a couple of classes. Uh, I met with executive coaches, and I really wanted to put the skills I learned and developed to the test again. And so I went to Florida Atlantic. You know, it's amazing the fall, right? I jokingly say my career goes like this, and then it drops. It looks like a stock market crash. And, um, you know, you're the, the national coach of the year at North Carolina in 2001 2003, I'm out of a job. 2005, the best job I could get was Florida Atlantic University. No offense to Florida Atlantic University, but it's a long way from the ACC. But the thing I loved about it, one, you realize why you love coaching. It's not about the fans in the stands or the media. Matter of fact, the first exhibition game, we were lucky to have 200 people in the stands, and there were no media credentials. So after the game, I went up to our SID, and I said, you know, post-game press conference, he said, um, there's no media here. I said, oh, perfect. I get to go back to the office <laughs> and watch Phil with the staff because it was all about basketball and coaching and teaching. And I thought that was a really good year for me 
as, as a professional. We've got a question for you from Peter LeBlanc. He's a North Carolina graduate, class of 99. He's currently a pastor at Beacon Community Church here in Hoffman Estates, Illinois. And he wants to know about what you can learn from adversity. You mentioned the fact that you went from the top of the college basketball world in North Carolina to, to a lesser school in Florida Atlantic. What did you learn from that experience and how can adversity make you a better leader going forward? Well, I think the first thing is that you have to be, um, hold yourself accountable. You have to say, and this is a Roy Williams quote, if I have one finger pointing at you, there are three pointing back at me. Right. So you could, if you don't take accountability for your role in your demise, shame on you. But once you take some accountability and say, okay, here's an opportunity to get better, everyone wants to help you. And I think that's the self-awareness it takes. Again, I go back to Stebbett. You got to know yourself. So <clears throat> I learned so many things, but when you know yourself and you realize you have some blind spots, that's when you really can start to get better because we all have them. And I remember after I lost my job, a friend of mine told me to meet with this executive coach at the University of Virginia the Darden School, and I went up there. I paid her $2,500 for a half a day in 2003. I took the Myers-Briggs assessment, and, and I, I don't know. I'm sure some people have heard about the Myers-Briggs assessment. It's basically a personality assessment, and I was beaten down. My confidence was down, and I remember going into her home and talking with her, and she told me that I was an ENTJ. And I jokingly said to myself, well, I've been called a lot of four-letter words, but none of them was ENTJ. And she said, you know, only 2% of the population are ENTJs. And I jokingly kind of say to myself, well, my shoulders went back. I kind of like felt like, yeah, you know, I am, I am a badass. You know, North Carolina just forced an elite coach to resign. And, and she kind of was reading my mind. And she says, no, no, you don't get it. She said, if only 2% of the population are ENTJs, that means 98% of the population don't think like you think. And I was like, that was one of those moments where I'm like, oh my gosh. So that's the self-awareness I think it takes through failure. Nelson Mandela, I collect quotes. I do a thought of the day every day on social media. Nelson Mandela has one of the best quotes. He says, I never fail. I either win or I learn. And I think that's the mindset, the growth mindset that we all should have. Because, oh, by the way, we will all fail. Yeah, and you know how it is in coaching and as a player, people always want to pat you on the back after you hit a game-winning shot or you win a conference title or you advance in the NCAA tournament. But when you're not doing well, no one's around. No one's there to really offer you support. How can you show leadership in those times? Is that sometimes the best examples of what being a good leader can be when your team or your business is not performing to your expectations? Well, I think true leadership is earned in the hard times. It's, it's, it's fairly easy to lead when everything's going well. And you remind me of a quote by John F. Kennedy said, victory has many fathers, defeat is an orphan. Right. And, and it's true. And so you have to keep that focus and understand that I'm not doing it for the adulation and the fan. I'm doing it because I love the game. I love the process. I love helping people get better. I love serving my people and my customers. And then put that in perspective. As a coach, you have to put that in I think it's all about perspective. This COVID pandemic, it's all about perspective. Losing. I was the head coach of the 8-20 and 20 North Carolina team. Worst record in Carolina history. And I may have done one of my better coaching jobs. Because it's all about getting better each day. And doing the best you can do with what you have. And, you know, the Bulls weren't very good before Michael got there. The Bulls weren't very good before Pippen got there. Then they got very good. But, you know, you can still do your best. And I think that's all you can ask yourself 
at night when you're looking in the mirror, did I do my best today? And, and that's really all you can ask of each other. So I think perspective is a huge thing with this COVID, you know, pandemic. I always say it could be worse. You know, it could be World War II. We could be at war with Germany. We could be, you know, our 19-year-old son could be off to war. Um, we could, you know, there could be so many things that could be worse. This is bad. Yes, people are dying. Yes, it's bad. Yes, we have to adjust our lifestyle. But if this is the worst thing that happens in our lives, we'll leave a pretty good life. And that's usually what I tell a team after a tough loss or a tough season. We have a lot of business leaders in the local area who are joining us uh, this afternoon. What advice would you give to them in terms of showing leadership? You mentioned the world situation. A lot of smaller businesses are shut down and being put in peril. How do you show leadership with that situation where you've got a group of employees or other businesses that are depending on you for their livelihood? And right now, a lot of things are out of your control in terms of trying to present a stable platform going forward. I think the biggest thing is compassion. You have to have compassion for the fellow man. You have to try to put yourself in their shoes, show empathy to understand what they might be going through. Because we all wear masks. Right. We all want to seem like we have everything under control. But we very rarely truly know what's going on in their household. You know, are there financial struggles? Are there people sick? You know, what is truly going on? And try to give hope. I think leaders in times of crisis need to do three things and three things well. One, tell the truth. Don't BS people. You know, keep it real. Two, develop a strategic plan with input from trusted advisors. And then three, clearly communicate that plan, sprinkling in a touch of hope. Because people need to feel that there is a better day coming around the corner. You've been out of the college coaching profession for a little bit of time. Uh, what advice would you give to coaches now? We saw the conference tournaments, NCAA tournaments canceled, aren't sure about what their summers are going to look like, trying to prepare ahead for next season. This is truly a challenge of leadership to make sure you've got the buy-in from your players, from your alumni, from your fan base when there's so much uncertainty about what's going to happen with all sports, not just college basketball. Yeah, no, it's, it's a challenge. I think I do what you all are doing. I'd have regular scheduled webinars. When there's a void in communication, people will create their own interpretation. So fill that void with the message you want delivered. I think you have to have consistent communication. As a coach, you'd have team meetings every day. Have team meetings every day on a webinar. Hey, guys, we're going to meet at 3 o'clock for 30 minutes, and we're going to discuss this. Have a book club. I think your life's impacted by three things. The people you meet, the books you read, and the experiences you have. Have them learn and grow. How can they learn and grow in this environment? Well, you could read. You could learn new things. So I think you need to try to create some normal routines where they can count on something every day so people aren't just laying in the bed, you know, all day watching Netflix. ESPN did a great feature right after most of the sports leagues were canceled where they call it senior night and they were honoring all those young men and women who didn't get a chance to complete their senior seasons, whether it was high school or at the college level because of the sports being shut down. This is really having an impact not only on the professional leagues and, and business revenues, but you feel so bad for the young athletes who only have this short time span in their lives to be in the spotlight, to enjoy the thrill of athletic competition. What, is it, what, what would you advise youth coaches in terms of trying to keep their kids motivated and let them know that maybe this year didn't work out the way we planned, but hopefully, It'll give you a chance to grow and be better in your sport and in life going forward. Yeah, good question. Uh, I have two varsity athletes, college varsity athletes. My son's a senior. 
was a senior at Bellman University in Louisville, played Division I lacrosse. His season was cut short. My daughter is a rower at the University of North Carolina. Season non-existent. It's hard. You know, as an adult, it's like, oh, this is no big deal. You know, come on, we'll get through this. No, no, no. Like, you have to show that empathy and put yourself in their shoes that, hey, this is a big deal. You know, my son didn't get to have his senior game. Right. You know, he, he didn't get to hug his teammates and cry on the field. He didn't get to do a lot of things that you envision as an athlete your, your first three years. So that's very hard. And I think you can't discount that. You need to listen to that and let them verbalize that because there is a little bit of mourning in that. And even though you can say, keep it in perspective, you're alive, you're healthy, you're not going off to war, whatever, it's still important to them. And so understand that, listen, and just give them a, a shoulder to, to kind of cry on it, so to speak. So I think that's, that's kind of critical. Um, this is going to be a challenge for coaches to stay connected because it's hard enough to stay connected to young people after the season. Um, but to stay connected with them and really, I think, go slow. I think you got to go slow. You got to listen. You got you to you gotta hear what's being said and maybe more importantly, what's not being said. Because this isolation can really be tough on some people because you don't know what the conditions are that they're living in. And especially most college coaches live in nice houses. You know, and their players, who knows what kind of communities they're living in, you know, where it was a real treat for them to live on a college campus. So to try to get to their level emotionally and listen, I think that's critical. I'm really fascinated by what you had to say about talking to your son about having his senior season cut short. You've spoken to Fortune 500 companies. You've dealt with some of the most influential sports figures in the world. What was that one-on-one -on -one conversation like with your son who really had to be devastated? Because those of us, I'm older than you, but I mean, you look back at your glory days in high school or you, your national championship in college, and, and you just treasure those memories, and that got snatched away from him. How difficult of a conversation was it for him? Um, you know, he acted like it wasn't that big of a deal, um, but you could tell it was. Uh, I think the coaches and the parents did a really good job. We had a webinar with all the seniors and the players and the coaches the day of what would have been their last game, which was last Saturday. So we all gathered and toasted the seniors and gave them all a chance to talk. And I was so proud of my son, who can be quiet. And the way he verbalized what it meant to be a part of that team uh, with his buddies and thanking a coach who we just had for one year or half a year. And my son didn't play. You know, he, he played, you know, minor, minor, minor minutes. But the way he handled that and the way he communicated his appreciation for his teammates and the coaches made his dad very proud. Yeah, those are experiences and relationships that you'll treasure for the rest of your life. There's no question about it. We've got more questions that have come from some of the attendees here on the webinar. This one is from Will Benson. He's the boys varsity basketball coach at Huntley High School in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. And he wanted to know about, more about that transition you talked about from North Carolina to Florida Atlantic. He wanted to know which coaches did you reach out to for some guidance and maybe did you attend some practice sessions along the way that helped you pick up some pointers, not only in game strategy, but in leadership? Yes, I went to a lot of practices. I think that's a real opportunity to learn and grow. Um, I remember going to the San Antonio Spurs, watching Greg Popovich practice, and Tim Duncan was there. And, and I think one thing I, I learned, one, it's fundamental. Basketball is a game of fundamentals. And he was doing drills that we would do at North Carolina. Two, he coached his most talented player the hardest. He could get on Tim Duncan, and the other guys would respond. However, Tim Duncan allowed him 
to coach him hard. I think that's the maturity level of Tim Duncan and any great leader. You look at the great teams, whether it be Michael, Larry Bird, Magic, Duncan, the best players were usually the smartest players, but also set the best examples. And um, so I, I think that's one thing that jumped out to me was, was Greg Popovich and the way he was fundamentals, just fundamental basketball, and he coached Duncan hard. And then after practice, he invited – he had all his assistants and some front office personnel and the guests at practice for dinner. And I think he's big on the social aspect of spending time with his people, players, coaches, away from the court so he can really get to know them and develop a trust. You know, folks watching the Last Stance documentary are getting a, getting a chance to see Dennis Rodman, you know, all his warts, some of the great things about him as a player, some of the eccentricities off the court. One of the interesting uh, conversations I had with him was during the 96-97 season, Greg Popovich at that time was the general manager of the Spurs, and he decided that he needed to make a coaching change. They were 3-15. and 15. He fired Bob Hill and decided to come down and coach the team himself. Now, he had traded Dennis to Chicago, and they kind of were like oil and vinegar. You know, they didn't really get along very well. And, you know, Dennis thought that Pop wasn't a good communicator, didn't have what it took to be a successful NBA coach. Well, all these years later, Greg Popovich is the winningest coach in NBA history. So I guess the worm maybe wouldn't have been suited to be a, an NBA GM, you think? Well, you know, listen, um, we all have these short snippets of times with people. And just think that Pop, I mean, how many years ago was that? That was 23 24, years ago? Yeah. I mean, so Pop obviously – learned and grew as a coach um, and Pop's a smart guy and you know I'm sure his communication with the players as as a GM was a lot different than it was as a coach right. and so uh, yeah it's it, we all grow and mature I mean you look back at some of those pictures and the comments and um, the players were you know more mature and the coaches were more mature and you know through experience comes wisdom I've seen a lot of your comments talking about the uh, North Carolina Duke rivalry. So this next question, I, I think I probably going to know the answer, but this comes from Don Cosley, one of our attendees today. What were the most hostile opposing gyms that you played in or coached during your career? Uh, St. Agnes High School uh, okay. on Long Island. <laughs> That's where Billy Donovan played. Billy and I went to rival high schools. He was a, uh, a four years younger, so we never played against each other, but that was one. Uh, Cameron, Reynolds Coliseum at NC State has to be up there as one of the most intense basketball environments, especially for a Carolina player ever. It was just loud, tight, hot, and they weren't afraid to say things that you don't normally say in public. Well, Cameron, of course, is such a tight, small arena. What was that like, that atmosphere? Obviously, the students are right on top of you. They're trying to do anything they can to unnerve you. Did you look forward? Did you relish that kind of a challenge as a player? Oh, gosh, man. If you didn't, then you shouldn't be playing. Right. I mean, the, the most enjoyable thing in sports is winning on the road, and you have the power to silence a crowd. <laughs> and if you really punish them, you get their fans to leave early. So that's the most – like, if you're a competitor, that's what you want. I mean, and, you know, I tell the team, Hey, we're going to go in there. We're going to. We have the power to control eight thousand Duke fans, and when we win, we are not going to celebrate on the court. We're going to shake their hands. We're going. We're going to. What did I say? Shake their hands like the Detroit Pistons didn't do. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to shake. The, we're going to shake their hands, and we're going to walk off into the locker room and celebrate in the locker room. And we did that at least one time when I was coaching and three of the four years when I was playing. Michelle Brady wants to know, take us behind the scenes of the celebration in the North Carolina locker room after winning the national championship. Of course, this is college sports. So there's no champagne uh, being popped in the locker room, but what was that atmosphere like? Maybe you could tell us a story about a special conversation you had or, 
or an experience that you'll always remember? Yeah, I, I'll take this picture off the wall. I think the thing, we were ranked number one in the preseason. And we were, you know, we had two losses. And you celebrate on the court, but I think there's a, a real moment of reflection after a game like that where you just calmly think back of everything you've been through, the highs, the lows. And, and this picture is really symbolic of that. Okay? Oh, yeah, that that's is, fantastic. That's Dean Smith and the sports information director. That's mm -hmm. James Worthy, and that's Jimmy Black. And you'll notice, like, you could easily say that's the losing, you know, holding – sell for the media uh, for the press conference the only thing that really shows that we won was James has a net around his neck and Jimmy Black has a national championship t-shirt <laughs> and I know oh, by the way coach Smith has a cigarette in his hand right yeah so to me that doesn't look like a celebration that's a reflection of the emotional the emotional drain it takes to go through a long season and then multiply that by three for an NBA team because they're playing you know, almost 100 games. We played 34. Um, it's just emotional draining. And when Michael hugs the trophy and cries, you know, it's just like, yeah, you can jump up and down. You jump up and down. And you're like, whoa, what did we just go through? That's kind of the emotions you get in the locker room after championship. Yeah, a special experience, something that I'm sure you'll treasure for the rest of your life. Another question from a good friend of mine, Joe DiGiacomo. He's our producer for our TV broadcast of Windy City Bulls basketball. He wants to know, what was the number one thing you learned from Dean Smith that molded you as a leader? I think there's so many. It's hard to say, Joe. It's hard to say that there's one thing. There's so many things. But one thing sticks out on a regular basis that Coach Smith would say is you want to praise the actions you want repeated. And I think back to my mother. My mother was really good at that. Uh, I was, you know, a little kid in the grocery store. I was getting antsy. I wanted to go to the playground. And she'd say, Matthew, you're so patient. And then I'd stand up straight and be still. Instead of saying, you know, Matthew, stop it. Coach Smith wanted to catch people doing things right because then you're more likely to do those things right. And oh, by the way, the people next to you, when they hear your praise for sprinting the floor or diving on a loose ball or setting a good screen, they'll want to do the th same things because we all want recognition. Another question from Kyle Thomas. He's a junior college basketball coach. He wants to know, how do you keep your players focused on the task at hand but they're also looking ahead to make that jump to the next level. I guess this could apply for grade school, high school, or, or junior college coaches. Yeah. I think that, you know, we're all selfish human beings. We all want what's best for us. I think you have to tell them that the better they commit to this team and this organization and getting better each day, the better opportunities they'll have at the next level. So you turn – that, that selfishness into a positive for the team. You know, if you just go out to try to get your points and the team loses, coach is going to see that. Um, and it, it go back to the last dance. I mean, Michael had to be sold on the triangle and giving up the ball and, and not being the leading scorer in the NBA. But as a result, the team was better. Another question from Roger Nichols, and this one – Matt, we could hold another hour and a half uh, webinar to talk about, but he wants to know, I guess in a, short, a shorter time frame, what is your opinion of the current state of AAU basketball? Ooh. I, I think it's bad. Um, it's been bad for a while. Um, the NCAA created it by limiting the summers and all the recruiting, and it just – the unintended consequence, I think, was AAU basketball. I think there's a role in it. But I don't think it's good for the game on a lot of fronts. I don't think kids understand teamwork. I don't think they understand 
how to lead. I don't think they understand how to hold each other accountable. Um, I'm not a big fan. And then it, it brings in these other influencers who don't always have uh, the best interest of the kids in their hearts. Yeah, very well stated. Obviously, that's a hot topic and something, as I said, we could spend hours talking about. Before we let you go, though, I do want to talk about what's become your new career as a, as a leadership coach, a motivational speaker. You're doing some great work for the John Maxwell team. Maybe you can talk about traveling around the country and, and sending your message of how to be a positive leader. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a website, coachmattdarty.com, and my last name spelled D-O-H-E-R-T-Y, coachmattdarty.com. And what hit me was after I lost my job in 2003 and I was taking classes at Wharton, at UPenn, and um, UVA's Darden School, just week-long classes, and I did some executive uh, work with uh, executive coaches. It hit me that in if I would have taken these classes before I was a head coach, I might have still been the head coach of North Carolina. And I'm thinking, why isn't there formal leadership training in sports? College athletics, pros, you know, all we do is lead people as a coach. All you do is lead people. GMs, all you do is lead people. But yet there's no formal development. Yes, yeah, some organizations, some co companies may have a weekend seminar or they might have a speaker come in and they might put you through a program for a day or two and check the box. But leadership development needs to be practiced. That's why I call it the Darty um, leadership practice. You need to practice it. It's like, okay, you want to be a golfer. All right, I'll go take a lesson. And then I don't play. I've taken a lesson. I read a book, and I'm going to go play a round of golf. I'm going to play terribly. I need to practice. I need to experience the ball coming off the club face. I need to experience, you know, the misses and how can I adjust and fix that on the golf course. Because golf is a uh, – leadership is a lot like golf. You think you have it mastered, and you, you bury your hole, and then you stand up on the next tee box, and what happens? You hit it out of bounds. <laughs> And then you got to gather yourself and hit a, hit, a, hit, a, hit a provisional. So, you know, when you think that, I, I, I use another analogy, you're, you're a leader, you're at the one yard line, you're getting ready to punch it in for a touchdown. All of a sudden, someone hits the button, extends the field another 100, year, 100 yards. You never arrive as a leader. You constantly have to practice and train and be self-aware and learn from your mistakes, fall, fail forward. John Maxwell talks about that. Fail forward. You will fail. Don't be afraid to fail. Learn from your failure, failures and get better. Well, last thing for me, Matt, maybe you could just repeat for some of the people who are with us today, how can they get in touch with you if they'd like to schedule, schedule you to yeah. speak to their group? The, the website, coachmattdaugherty.com. On my website are phone numbers, emails. Um, you submit a request. Um, I, I, I don't coach a basketball team anymore, so I coach individuals, I coach corporations, I do executive um, leadership, I do keynote talks, and that's fulfillment for me when I feel like I've connected. Like this morning, a friend of mine who runs a car dealership in town, I've been working with his group, and he said, you know, I've really noticed a change in one of the people you've been working with. Um, that's, that's my... Duke victory. You know, that's my high five. Same feelings when I feel like a player has gotten better and he says, thanks, coach, for working with me. That's why you do it. Well, Matt, this has been such a pleasure to get a chance to reconnect. Uh, wonderful advice that you've given to all our attendees today. Thank you so much for joining the webinar. Love the Carolina Blue behind you. I was cheering for you guys all the way in 82. Love the unis, love the university, and, and we're Really honored to have you with us. Brad's going to come back. He's going to thank you one more time and, and wrap this thing up. So I just want to give my personal thank you, and hopefully we can connect again down the line. Thank you for your, your pro. Brad? Well, that, that was great. Uh, Matt, what, what an enjoyable, you know, conversation. What, you know, just the insights, the stories. You know, I, I think that 
you know, having you talk to our community, our, our Windy City Bulls family, um, this is just what we need right now, you know, and, and everybody's, you know, looking for some inspiration, some, some great um, content and, and, and stories. And so we appreciate your time in doing this, um, you know, for the Windy City Bulls family that's, that's tuned in. We appreciate you taking the time out of your lunch hour to, to join us and, and participate in this. And like we said at the beginning, um, we're excited to, to continue doing this with, with special guests like Matt. Um, we appreciate Mark, uh, you know, visiting with us today to, to host today. Um, but again, can't thank you enough for, for talking to us, talking with us, um, answering some great questions. And, and we, again, really appreciate your time today, Matt. Thank you very much. Go Bulls.